Teardown time. Uh, this is a, a key fob for opening the doors on an old Honda Civic, a 2001. I used to own it. found it in my junk drawer when I was cleaning up my workshop today, and I thought I'd tear it apart and look at the technology in it. Uh, if you flip it over, you'll see an FCC ID that's required by law for uh, anything which is an intentional radiator and sold in the States, which is very helpful. You can go onto this FCC website. I'll just show the address there. And it'll tell you uh, who made it, and uh, more importantly, the frequency it operates, 433.995 megahertz, and it comes from uh, Toku Alps, which of course makes tremendous sense, because that's a long-term vendor for Honda. Let's uh, put that frequency into the spectrum analyzer, and uh, power up the fob there, uh, just disassemble the battery at the back, and I'll press the button, and of course you can see it does a nice little burst of uh, RF energy. Uh, which, of course, would be the command to open the door. And if I was to uh, put this thing into persistent mode and uh, do multiple sweeps, what we're going to see here is the RF envelope is uh, different each time I press the button. What that's telling me is that the code's rolling, or essentially it's producing a different uh, output each time uh, it uh, is pressed. And, of course, it makes sense. Uh, you don't want to send the exact same signal each time. Uh, otherwise, you have a big security hole in your uh, control for your car. Uh, this is the frequency domain. Okay, let's go to the time domain. I've uh, taken the battery out and I've powered the unit up with a uh, lab power supply. And then I've hooked a couple of scope probes up and uh, I got the output onto a scope here. Two signals. There's an enable signal, as you would imagine, because it's a battery-powered application. You don't want to drain the battery. But it runs here and then it encodes a bit of data. Uh, let me uh, inset the, uh, the next photograph as we zoom in here. What we're going to see, uh, undoubtedly, is the data pattern changes uh, because obviously you don't want to send the same sequence each time because that would be a security risk. So now taking a look at the waveform here is, of course, enable the transmitter. It looks like a really uh, repetitive pattern to start with. And that's what you expect. It's basically creating some sort of carrier. It's basically allowing the local oscillator on the car to wake up and recognize that an event is going to occur. And then if we scroll a bit over here, uh, we should see a data pattern eventually. And uh, if you ever buy an A10 scope, know that the scrolling of the buffer is painfully slow. Okay. That was a little off topic, I suppose. Here's the actual pattern. You see it has a bit uh, more of a data type uh, look to it. And uh, this is the actual uh, key uh, being sent out to unlock the door of the car. Um, let's see, I'm going to change the scope uh, so it triggers on the falling edge here because it looks like otherwise I would just catch the carrier, which isn't so interesting. And uh, we'll try pressing the button and seeing if this data pattern changes. Okay, so I've got the scope now triggering on the falling edge of the uh, power enable to the transmitter. I think all the data is actually at the end of the transaction here after the carrier has been locked. It sends out the pattern. And what we should see uh, is every time you press the button, the data pattern should change. Uh, this is known as rolling the code. So basically, it's trying to send out a different pattern each time. So there's a bit of security uh, in the protocol. So press the button once there. And I press the button again. Of course, you can see the pattern starting to change. And uh, this, of course, allows some level of security on these wireless fobs. So very cool. Let's uh, take a look at the actual circuit and uh, see what's inside of it. So here's the top of the circuit board, uh, obviously four positions for some push-button switches, uh, three populated. I think the one that wasn't populated was meant for a trunk release in some models. Uh, the integrated circuit there is undoubtedly a microcontroller. Uh, since this was for a 2001 car, uh, the design would of course date to the late 1990s, uh, and that was before any sort of really complicated uh, integration of RF circuitry was occurring on silicon. So I suspect that's just a microcontroller. However, we'll do an acid de-encapsulation and take a peek of it later in the video here to just sort down what we're looking at. Those part numbers are some sort of proprietary code. Couldn't find anything on the internet. Uh, below that, uh, looks like a crystal, that uh, silver can, but it's got six leads on it, which is kind of strange to say the least. Um, I must admit, I don't know what's going on there. Uh, so if anyone out there has a clue, give me a shout. I wouldn't mind uh, trying to sort that one down further. On the back side uh, is, of course, the heart of the RF circuitry. Uh, not too complicated, except there's one extremely neat component on it, and that's the surface acoustic wave part under that silver can. Uh, basically, it acts like a crystal. I suspect it sets the frequency of operation, and then uh, you can tweak it, basically pull it with a, a voltage source and uh, cause the carrier to shift and do some frequency modulation, if I understand the circuitry correctly. If you Google the circuitry, uh, you can come up with all sorts of uh, reference designs that look pretty close. I think it's a Colpitt's oscillator. And uh, you can sort of look at the fact it's a single transistor and start matching up the components to it. So it looks pretty straightforward. Uh, certainly pretty old school uh, design. Okay, 
all sorts of neat things going on here. This is the uh, saw component. I unsoldered it from the circuit board. Uh, then I had to put it under a blowtorch basically to get it apart. Uh, they use a very high temperature solder to connect that metal cap to the bottom uh, ceramic substrate. It makes sense because eventually these components get soldered onto a circuit board, so you have to select a very high temperature solder uh, to assemble the component. Uh, in the center there is a bit of quartz with some uh, pad structure. Let's put that under the microscope and take a closer look at it. And what we can see uh, is a whole bunch of cool things. Um, the first one, of course, is that uh, it's, it's transparent, and that's because it is quartz. And then they've uh, got two bond pads, it looks like there, so they can bond the connections outwards. Um, and the really cool thing about saw devices is that they're basically uh, distorting the quartz to create uh, electromechanical signals and uh, all sorts of uh, clever engineering going on in that uh, component. Okay, let's uh, go back to that microprocessor. I've de-encapsulated and let's see uh, what's sitting in that device. So here's confirmation. It's a microcontroller. The mass copyright is from uh, NEC, a Japanese company, of course. Uh, 1994, it's about the right date, about six years before the, the fob was used inside a uh, industrial application. Uh, lots of these industrial processors have uh, really long lives. Um, they can last for decades as viable products. I'm just zooming out to the whole die photograph. You can see again, it's a very old process node. Uh, and it looks like it is indeed entirely digital or uh, low speed analog for things like the clock oscillator and uh, whatever voltage regulators they may have needed for the uh, device. So there you go, yet again, a small, simple device in a world just chock full of all sorts of neat engineering.